Is it the U.S. U.S. mail or a third-party carrier like UPS or Federal Express 
And in the case of wire fraud, they use an interstate wire communication. That could be anything like a fax, a phone call, an email, even a wire transfer of money. <coughs> and they use the mails or wires for the purpose of executing their scheme. Pretty simple. I give you these definitions because the case I'm going to talk about later involves wire fraud. So if you kind of remember what the definition is, you can follow along. Now, as Austin said, my title is Auditor, which is somewhat of a misleading title. A better title would be Forensic Accountant. And when I say the word forensic, most people are thinking of the CSI, they find a dead body, you figure out how long it's been dead, how it died. And really, if you look up the definition in the dictionary, it's defined as belonging to, used in, or suitable to a court of justice for a public discussion and debate. So really, when you put forensic with accounting, it truly is a marriage between accounting and the law. Now, as a forensic accountant, my main job is to help put the pieces together of the financial portion of our investigation. And I pretty much rely on three sets of knowledge to help me piece that puzzle together. The first and most obvious one is my accounting knowledge. I can guarantee you almost every single case I start off analyzing somebody's bank account, whether that be your personal account or a company's account. And you can tell a lot about somebody by looking at their bank account. I can tell you where you work. I can tell you what you like to eat. I can tell you where you shop. I can tell you if you got a mistress. I can tell a lot of things. But it's not just limited to the bank accounts. I often look at the books and records and financial statements of individuals or companies. A lot of times, I have to identify journal entries that may not fit so well into what a legitimate business is doing. I also can look at investment accounts. Um, I can't name the case, but I did work on a very high-profile insider trading case of a CEO that was prosecuted in Denver that I had to go through and analyze his investment accounts and figure out what he did with the stock options that his company gave him. I also look at credit cards, loan accounts, tax returns, anything with a dollar sign, the agents and the attorneys pretty much give to me what they have. Now once I've analyzed them, organized the documents, I've got to be able to tell people what I've seen in these records. And that can be in a variety of formats that I tell them what's going on. In the case of maybe I have to offer an expert report to the court, I'll, that would be in a, in a written format. If you've ever tried to write out what's happening in county in words, not numbers, it's not easy. But mostly I do spreadsheets, charts, graphs, those kinds of things. And then I always have to consider the audience that I'm conveying the information to. My first audience, of course, are the agents and the attorneys that I work with. And a lot of them are seasoned. They know accounting. When I say debit or credit, they understand but it's not just limited to that audience. It can be um, to the judges and to the probation department when it comes time to sentence somebody to jail. And it probably by far the most biggest audience that I have is the potential trial jury. I don't have any idea of the 12 members of the jury, what their education is, what their life experience is, what they do for a living. So I need to make sure when I'm talking about complex financial transactions, that it's easy for them to understand. Because if they have a reasonable doubt as to what I'm talking about, we're not going to get a conviction. Okay? Now the second piece of information that I rely upon is my investigative knowledge. Now this is something that I've never had formal training on. Everything I have learned, I have learned from the agents that I've worked with. So besides the financial records, I also look at other types of records that could help me in the analysis. It may be pulling public records. For example, a lot of the mortgage fraud cases, I end up going to the um, clerk and recorder and to pulling the deeds of trust that are filed in our cases. But it can also be marriage and divorce records. It could be bankruptcy records. Any type of record that the general public could go in and get a copy of. It could also be phone records, especially in the case of wire fraud. We'll get phone records for a business or the target that we're looking at and trying to identify the calls that we might be able to charge him with. Um, 
It's also good for identifying our victims, if we don't know about somebody that's been defrauded by our target. And it also helps identify um, other people that could be involved in the crime, other people that we may end up charging them again. You can also look at industry-specific records. I worked a very large bank fraud case um, that was insiders of the bank as well as people outside of the bank. And they created this scheme, and basically the bank had to shut down. It was a $248 million loss to all the taxpayers of the United States. Um, for that case, I had never worked in a bank. I didn't know the accounting for a bank. I knew the specific entries that are made that I had to become familiar with. And to learn how, by them manipulating those entries, how that affected how bankers calculated their bonus and was able to walk out of the bank with a lot of money. On top of that, the banks have a particular industry in which they have to file reports with the FDIC that are just specific to the banks. So I need to be familiar with those to identify the fraud and how it worked its way through the accounting records and then into the reports that the public relies upon. Besides other records, I'm able to go out and interview witnesses, and oftentimes I meet with the victims to get their side of the story. A lot of times, especially when it comes to a specific financial issue, the agents rely on me to develop the questions that, that we end up asking the, the people. Also through um, the collection of evidence I'm involved in. And that's not so much physical evidence, but maybe sending out a subpoena to get bank records. I need to identify who do I send the subpoena to? What are the records that I'm going to be asking for? And then, always in the back of my mind, I consider what might be an asset that we could potentially have for them and get the money back to the victim. If our bad guy has bought a house, sent the money offshore, bought some jewelry, we'll make sure we find it and get the money back to the victim. And then lastly is be able to testify in different court proceedings about the <coughs> I've either testified in grand jury or in trial over 30 times. Five of those times has been as an expert witness, which is a very specific kind of witness. Most people, when they go in to testify, they talk about what they saw and what they did and what they heard. Whereas an expert, you have to go through a set of procedures where the court qualifies you, and that's based upon your knowledge, your experience, your training. And once you're qualified, you are able to give an opinion about the evidence, which is something a regular witness can't do. Most of the time, though, I testify as what they call as a summary witness. And that's not necessarily summarizing all the facts in the case, but being able to say, I have 20 boxes of paper that I've gone through, and here's what those 20 boxes say. Okay? Now the third piece of knowledge is my legal knowledge. I need to definitely not have a law degree, but I do need to know what the violations of our federal code could be and the potential charges that we could bring. I also need to know about the rules of evidence, how a piece of paper or a witness statement can be come into court and be entered as evidence. If we don't collect it the right way, if we don't maintain the custody of it the right way, it might not be able to get entered. And then lastly is to know the legal process, which I don't know that a lot of people are familiar with. Um, a lot of times you watch a television show or a movie and the whole investigation to sending somebody in jail takes an hour, two hours, and that's definitely not the case in our cases. It typically starts when the investigation is opened by an agency, typically the FBI, but we do work with other agencies like the IRS, Postal Service. And in white collar crime, it's rare that we open a case as the crime is in process. Um, it does happen, but it's rare. Usually, the investigation doesn't get opened until long after the crime has happened, the guy's taken the money, and then the victim figures out what happened. The next step that I am heavily involved in is, as I said, the collection of evidence, whether that's getting documents, interviewing people. And that takes us to the next step of our grand jury presentation. Now, the grand jury is a very important step in this entire process, probably next to the trial jury, the second most important. And it is guaranteed in the Fifth Amendment that you cannot be charged with a crime 
unless on presentation of an indictment by the grand jury. And the grand jury is a group of normal citizens pulled from driver's license and voting members. There are 16 to 23 people on the grand jury, and they agree to serve as a grand juror for 18 months. And for three or four days, every month, they come down, and they listen to the United States attorneys present the different kinds of investigations that we're working on. Now, a lot of times, the process will collect evidence, go talk to the grand jury. <coughs> Some more evidence, come back to the grand jury. At some point in time, we will ask the grand jury to return an indictment. And the grand jurors, what they are responsible for doing is based upon probable cause that a crime has been committed, that they'll return the indictment. So it's a low standard. It's not beyond a reasonable doubt like a trial jury. If they've decided that, that there is probable cause, they'll return the indictment, which is just the formal document that charges somebody with a crime. And it's an important document in that it really becomes our blueprint at trial on how we're going to present the case. So after the indictment, we will have the person arrested. Oftentimes in white collar cases, they've known about our investigation and we will allow them to come in and turn themselves in. So that's why you don't see a lot of times some big arrests knocking down doors, dragging the white collar criminal out his front door. That's the point in time that typically we get involved with the defense attorneys. Either they, the defendant hires them on their own or they're appointed by the court. And then we have the arraignment process, which the person goes in front of the judge, the indictment's read, and he's formally charged, knows what he's looking at, and is advised of all of his rights. Then we get to the process of discovery and motions, and I'm typically heavily involved in that because it's preparing all the evidence that we've gathered getting it in a format to be able to turn over to the defense attorney so they can review it, do their own interviews, do their own investigation. And we have lots of motions, whether it's the attorneys talking back and forth, stuff filed with the court that a judge has to decide. Once that process is over with, we'll go to hopefully a change of plea, where somebody will come in and agree to plead guilty to either all or part of the indictment, or we go to trial. And as I've stated, the trial is now gone from probable cause for the grand jury to beyond a reasonable doubt, which is an extremely high standard. It's not to be taken lightly. Like then through trial, hopefully if we've proven our case, we'll go to a sentencing hearing. And with sentencing on the federal level, we have a set of sentencing guidelines. And it's basically a formula that calculates how much time a person is looking at spending in prison. And that formula is based upon a lot of factors. Does the person have a criminal history? Obviously, if somebody's been doing crime throughout their life, they're gonna spend a lot more time in prison. It also takes into consideration the type of crime. Obviously, a terrorist is gonna spend a lot more time than your bank teller that's embezzling money. And probably the largest part for white collar crime sentence determination is the amount of loss. The more money they take or attempt to take, the more time they're going to spend in prison. And a lot of time that figure is based upon the work that I do. Now, this entire process takes months, sometimes even years. The bank fraud case that I told you about, the bank went under July of 1998 and that's when we opened the case. It was only last week that we finally got our final sentence. So 12 years later, it's quite a long time. The wheels of justice turn slow, but they turn. So keep that in mind. The case that I'm going to tell, tell you about is somewhat unique in that from start to finish, it was basically one year. The crime occurred April through August of 95. The victims <coughs> discovered it, brought us in. We had an indictment in June, and we had our trial in September. And probably one of the main reasons for that quick motion was that our victim was 88 years old and not in good health. And if that victim <coughs> passed away, we probably would not have had a case. So I hope that kind of shows you, for my job, how it incorporates both the law enforcement element, the legal element, as well as the accounting element. Now I know the question I'm going to get is, how do I get your job? It sounds really interesting. 
I would recommend that if you if you are interested in this, that you definitely take some type of courses in criminal justice or criminal law. I am by no means saying go get a gun, become an agent, or go get your law degree. But it would have been helpful for me to have kind of that basis of knowledge. Okay? Don't expect to get my kind of job directly out of college. Um, I know from the federal system, they don't know, they always look at your education, but they also look at your work experience. So if you can get some type of job that you can hone in on your analytical skills, keep your accounting skills up to date, that is great. And I throw in under experience is to do your civic duty if you ever get a jury summons. I know most adults kind of shudder at the fact when we get that in the mail. It takes time off of work, I don't have much time, I'm going to lose money. But it really is a worthwhile experience. My parents lived here when I was in college, and I was lucky enough to get summoned when I was home for summer break. And I was selected, sat on a civil jury. They settled the case before we got it. But it was a very interesting experience, and had I known that this was the career path, I would have paid a lot more attention. Even if you have a chance to go in to any courtroom and just sit in on a trial for an hour or two, you'll kind of get a sense of the hard work that it takes to get a case prosecuted. Of course, I'm gonna, since I'm an accountant, I'm going to say get your CPA. It's months and months of torture. Two and a half days, you never want to remember, but it's well worth it. And then I would also say, get your certified fraud examiner's license. It's somewhat of a new certification, certainly not as established as the CPA, but it really is a specialized certificate um, that talks exactly about what I do. Okay? Now, I know most of the other speakers have been talking about ethics. And I'm going to handle a lot of the fraud part, but for my ethics soapbox, I'm going to say regardless of where you end up getting a job, you're probably going to work for a company that's going to have a code of conduct or some type of ethical standards that if you don't follow, you're going to lose your job. And that may not be a big deal because there's lots of jobs out there. As a CPA and a CFE, though, your ethical standards go to a little bit higher level. They have their own code of ethics that you need to follow. So besides of losing your job if you violate those, you could be hit with a monetary fine. You could also lose your license if you work so hard to get. And as for my, my job, I'd say I'm in, at an even higher level of ethics just because I'm a member of law enforcement. And society expects <coughs> law enforcement to do the right thing and follow the laws that we vow to protect. So when we have an agent that maybe hasn't done things the right way, it's hard for me to watch that. Um, I know personally, when I'm on the stand and I'm testifying, I've got to testify truthfully to what the documents say. And if that truth helps the government, that's great. If the truth helps the defendant, that's fine too. But I know that if I ever lie on the stand, that's not only going to hurt that case that I'm talking about, but all the cases I work down the road. Because it will get around through the defense community. And every defense attorney will challenge my credibility as a witness. And I've worked too hard to let that happen. So that's my ethics talk. So to talk about this next case that involves our next CPA, I want you to think about the question as far as what a CPA stands for. Does it stand for Certified Public Accountant? Or does it stand for Cut, Paste, and Attach? Okay. Now we basically have three players in this case, the first one involving Timothy Janus. I'm sorry for the poor quality of the pictures. They don't take, they don't have really high quality digital cameras in prison. So. And we have our victims, Carl and Bertha Cass, and their granddaughter, Kathleen Huffman. Now, Mr. and Mrs. Cass were 88 years old, lived in Washington, D.C., and like many other generations, worked very hard all their lives, strength and save, lived modestly and had safely invested their earnings and had an estate well over, well, worth well over $3 million at the time of the crime. They were living in their house that they had built themselves, and as they were getting up in years, they were having major health problems. In fact, Mr. Cass was bedridden, was unable to communicate, and he was really unable to handle any of the financial affairs, so that kind of left Bertha in charge. 
Now Kathleen lived out here in Colorado, and she was receiving substantial income from her grandparents, who were very generous to her. She really wanted to move them out to Colorado so she could help take care of them. And in late 1994, she met Mr. Janice, who was working as a private financial consultant, and he told her he could help her file her income taxes. Well, Kathleen had told um, Mr. Janice about her grandparents and the difficulties they were having getting on in years, and that they really need to have some assistance. So Mr. Janice met with Bertha and Kathleen, and he had told them what a wonderful person he was, that he, you know, had a law degree, had practiced law in South Dakota, he had taught several law classes at various universities, he had his security license so he could trade uh, securities. At one point in time, he had been employed by a large national accounting firm and was in charge of estate planning for individuals. He had told them that he was a CPA in South Dakota, in Nebraska, and Colorado. And by talking with them, he gained Bertha and Kathleen's trust. And it was solely based upon these representations that he had made to them that they agreed to have him help with their personal and financial affairs. But, as you could suggest, that he didn't really tell them the whole truth. He didn't tell them that his license to practice law was no longer valid. And he never told them that even though he was certified in South Dakota and Nebraska as a CPA, he lost his license. And he never told them he never was certified in Colorado. He just told them he was. So we're dealing with a really stellar guy, aren't we? So what was agreed upon and what Mr. Janice was going to do was to help the Castles with their estate planning, handle some of the other financial matters like filing Kathleen's tax returns, and to assist in the purchase of the home in Colorado. And what Ms. Huffman wanted, we'll get to the house thing in a minute. So what did he do? Okay, so he did prepare certain codices for their will, specific amendments to their trust. And this was one of the documents. Now the way we got this document, as I told you in the grand jury, a lot of times that is just the government presenting evidence. The defendant doesn't come in, the target of the investigation doesn't come in, there's not a defense attorney, it's not like what you see in trials, it's just strictly the government's evidence. On occasion, we will, the grand jury will subpoena the target of our investigation to say, come on in and tell us your side of the story. Sometimes targets do that, sometimes they don't. Now Mr. Janice in this case was very confident and when it was discovered and brought to authorities he was like this is all a big misunderstanding, I can explain all of this, I've got documents, let me come in and talk. So he did take the opportunity to come into the grand jury and that's how we got this piece of paper that was in his files. And it is a legitimate document, there's nothing wrong with it, signed by Bertha, notarized, everything's fine with it. But keep this piece of paper in mind because it does play an important part down the road. Now the other thing that Mr. Janice was going to do was to help move the castles out to Colorado. Now what Kathleen's plan was, was to purchase a small house for Bertha and Carl to live in. And then purchase a much larger house and some property that would be right next door to the small house. And the castles agreed to do that. So... Mr. Janice decided as Kathleen is moving her grandparents across the United States, he would close on the house, everything would be ready to go when they arrived. And in order to do that, the Cassas gave Mr. Janice three different checks. And it, they gave it to him at a point in time that it was really close to the closing. And the, literally the day of the Cassas moving out here, which was quite chaotic as you can imagine, moving two elderly people across the United States, Mr. Janice informed Kathleen that the checks aren't going to clear in time, and the closing's tomorrow, and so you got to get me some additional money. So what they agreed to do was wire transfer $575,000 to an account in the name of the Children's Education Center, which was the business run by Mr. Janice's wife, which was fine. That wasn't the problem. What was the problem was that he had twice as much money as he needed to close. He went and closed on the small house and on the large house. 
And for the land, even though he had plenty of money to buy the property free and clear, he decided to execute a $90,000 promissory note that Ms. Huffman never knew that she owed $90,000 on this property. She thought she owned it free and clear. Now, when confronted about returning the money, Mr. Janice says, I'll do it. It's all okay. Well, let's just get you guys moved out here. Everything will be fine. So, what did he do with that money that he had extra? He decided to loan it to third parties. And these were loans that were made payable not to the Cass's or to Ms. Huffman, but to entities that he controlled. And they were notes that were due way far in the future, when an 88-year-old husband and wife would probably be dead, and nobody would know the difference, and the money would be coming to him instead. And he also spent some of the money for his personal use. Now that would be bad enough. And this all happened in the span of two months, May, June of 95. Then starting in around July, Mr. Janice decided to just go ahead and help the Casses and Ms. Huffman by communicating with the various investment companies where most of their money was held. The first communication was a July 25th letter that was sent to Vanguard. And there's that letter. Sent to Vanguard, purportedly signed by Bertha, <coughs> requesting that they change the wiring <coughs> instructions for money to be sent to the Children's Education Center bank account, and that to go ahead and wire $320,000. And if you have any questions, make sure you call Mr. Janice. Now, this was trouble, to say the least, because when we have an accusation of Mr. Janice stole our money, yet we have a letter that's signed by Bertha, okaying him to take the money. Now when we talked to Bertha, even though she was 88 years old, she was one smart cookie. She was adamant she had never signed this letter. That's her signature, but she did not sign it. Now from a prosecution standpoint, that's trouble, because that enough could be reasonable doubt to a jury. And I can definitely see a defense attorney saying, Bertha's so sweet and nice, she just doesn't remember. And that could be a firm case. So, as I'm going through all the records, whether it's financial records or the records that Mr. Janice gave us, I had to think, how else could Bertha's name have gotten on this letter? Now, going through all the documents can be boring at times, but it has its advantages in that I get to see lots of patterns, patterns on how somebody spends money, but I also get to see patterns on somebody's signature. And I am by no means a handwriting expert. And at trial, we ended up having a handwriting expert testify. But if you compare the letter, or the codicil, that we absolutely know was worth the signature, and you compare that to the letter, sure looks like the same signature. And in fact, at trial, we literally had two pieces of plastic that had both these documents on there put it on an overhead projector, overlaid them to show the jury that it was indeed the exact same signature, just cut, paste, and attached to the letter that got sent to the and transferred $320,000. Now, besides the letter, we end up having a phone call to another investment institution requesting $250,000. Can you hear that? You can't hear that.
too bold. Either Carl had a miraculous, miraculous recovery and could make a two-minute phone call, or it was Mr. Jens. And he didn't stop there. He'd think he'd stop, but he didn't. August 14th, similar letter to Vanguard. Remember, this is the same company where he had already changed the wiring instructions. Again, we have requesting a $250,000 wire for some state planning and to contact Mr. Janice if you have questions. And once again, we had Bertha saying, that's my signature, but I did not sign it. We go back to that same document, and instead of using that signature, we get to use the other one. And sure enough, exact same signature. Then we had yet another letter, this time signed by Mr. Janice. The transaction never happened, but he did attempt to get another $80,000. Now, we already know about the loans to the third parties with the home money that he had. But he then took the remaining money that he got based upon the letters and the phone call to send out another million dollars to, again, additional third parties. They were loans that Ms. Mrs. Cass and Kathleen never authorized him to do. There were no promissory notes executed except two until after he was confronted about it. And a lot of times these loans were based upon verbal understandings where the terms were not always agreed upon between what Janice was telling us and what these third parties were telling us. He made them payable to this nonprofit entity well into the future. And in a couple of cases, he made this nonprofit entity, he made the notes prior to establishing the entity's existence by filing articles of incorporation. And as I said, it was, these notes were going to be due two, three, four, thirty years down the road when Bertha and Carl would long be gone. The other thing he tried to do was cover up his tracks once Kathleen and the Castles had confronted him. Um, towards the end of July, early August, I think he was getting a little bit nervous because he drew up a letter that was backdated to the 5th of July, which basically explained in great detail how this transfer of one and a half million dollars to this unidentified charity was going to be a great tax savings device for the Casses. And he attempted to have Bertha sign it. In fact, Bertha's memory was so sharp, she remembers Janice coming to visit her in the small house. He was acting very nervous, very weird, wanting her to sign this document. And she was not going to sign it until Kathleen had a chance to look at it. Well, Kathleen started to come down the walkway, and Bertha remembers Janice gathering up the papers, tripping over a baby gate to get out the door before Kathleen had showed up. Once he was confronted, he did go back and obtain additional promissory notes for the loans that he had made, but he still had them payable to this Montessori nonprofit school. Pretty bold. Now, when it comes to my analysis in this case, again, starting off with the bank accounts and the investment accounts, getting a wide variety of documents, the whole purpose, best shown by Jerry Maguire, right? Everybody knows it? What's the phrase? Thank you. And that's exactly what I do. I show how much money came in from the Cassis to Janice's accounts. How much money did he have from other sources? He really did not have any other job other than taking the money from the Cassis. I also was able to show the transfers that went from the Children's Education Center account to his personal accounts. That shows kind of the laundering of the money and how he tried to hide it. I was able to identify expenses that he did actually spend to help the Cassis, as well as the loans to third parties so we could go out and talk with them, along with personal use. And then there was some money left in the bank account that we were able to get back to the Cassis. But besides uh, showing the money flow, the bank accounts and investment accounts identified the other witnesses to interview in the case. That's how we received that recording, by going to the investment institutions, and they record all their conversations. So remember that if you ever try to make a phone call. Um, we were able to identify other records that we needed to get. We could identify possible defenses, um, identify co-conspirators. We did look at a time at Mrs. Janice 
but the evidence just wasn't there to charge her in this crime. The bank accounts can also identify exculpatory information as well as identifying the assets that we can get seized. So we have the real property records that we looked at, which were integral in identifying the third parties and how much was owed. We were able to get the notes that were in existence reassigned to the CASAs so they were not going to be out any of their money. And then as well as getting the phone records. Now, this is what the first page of an indictment looks like. You never, ever want to see your name right there, right above the defendant line. I need you in big trouble. And as I said, the blueprint is the indictment, and we basically detail what the scheme is. Pages and pages and pages of the scheme. And then we end up getting to the meat and potatoes as far as what the specific counts are. We ended up charging Mr. Janice with seven counts of wire fraud. The first two being associated with a couple of the first promissory notes that he made. Then we, number three was the first letter that was forged. Count four was the phone call. Count five was the actual wire transfer of the money that he had requested in the phone call. Uh, count six was the August forged letter. And then count seven was the uh, attempt to get $80,000. Now at trial time, we had a whole list of people to come in and testify for the prosecution. Uh, Carl, unfortunately, had passed away in March of 1996 prior to us getting the indictment. Bertha was wonderful. She was our star witness. Even though just uh, a month before trial started, she fell and hit her head, had a subdural hematoma, and could have easily passed away, which would have fit into Janice's plans. But she powered back, and she was awesome. Um, we had Kathleen testify, as well as the people that received the loans. As I said, we had our handwriting expert that testified that those were not worth the signatures, that they were cut and pasted from the legitimate document. And then I was able to testify. Um, this was the first time I ever got qualified as an expert witness, was, which was huge. I was also the advisory <coughs> witness, which means I got to sit through the entire trial at the table with the attorney, help pick the jury, help identify the exhibits as they come in. But as I said, my most important role was summarizing all the evidence. Because I sat there at trial, the judge allowed me to try and put the pieces of the puzzle for the jury. One of the summary charts that I testi testified to was just showing how the money flowed from the Cass and Huffman accounts through the Children's Education Center accounts and where it got spent. Another critical exhibit, and it's a little bit faded, um, we literally had a calendar for this four or five month time period, and it was critical as to the timing of certain events, so we color-coded different activities. For money transactions, money coming in was green, money going out was red, we had all the wire communications, whether they be faxes or phone calls, as well as some of the other activities, such as when he incorporated the business or made the promissory note. Now, for the defense, basically his wife and himself. Um, his wife tried to get on the stand to say, we're just poor folk, you know, we just want to help these people, which in her mind she thought was helping. Um, I have a very astute female uh, prosecutor um, who was just peppering Mrs. Janice with lots of questions. And her testimony pretty much wrapped up when the prosecutor asked a question isn't it true that such and such? And Mrs. Janice was just so frustrated, she literally on the stand said, yeah, whatever, made the whole courtroom laugh. Mr. Janice decided to testify, which he didn't have to, but he literally got up and tried to teach the jury, had a, had a pad of paper, walk them through how this was such a wonderful tax-saving device, and you could literally get caught up in how Kathleen and Mrs. Cass, maybe not being so financially astute, would have believed this man. So after 14 days of trial, we did get a conviction on all counts, and Mr. Janice was sentenced in January 97 for 63 months in order to pay back additional restitution. Now that would normally be where my presentation would end. But after going to South Dakota to serve his time in a federal prison camp, I think Mr. Janice decided that just wasn't his cup of tea. 
And he decided in January of 98 to literally walk out of the prison camp with the help of his wife, and they escaped to the Dutch Antilles down in the Caribbean. In March of 99, we finally caught up with him. He was taken into custody on the island of St. Martin. And part of the extradition treaty with St. Martin is that he couldn't be extradited for escape, but he could be extradited because he didn't finish his sentence. A technicality, but a formal one. Because once he got back to the U.S., we still couldn't, at that point in time, pros prosecute him for escaping from the prison. So he did go back, and he did finish his time. Then in 1993, he took his family of six children and his wife, and they moved to Hawaii. And he ended up getting a job with the Salvation Army as a director of planned giving. Salvation Army didn't know about his record. Easily Googleable in this day and age, but they didn't know about it. And as you can guess, he did not learn his lesson from his experience in Colorado, and he ended up taking over $300,000 from four elderly donors over a two-year time period. And of course, his little scheme included money and the property being sent to an entity under his control. And in fact, he sold one of the properties and put the money in his pocket. Thankfully, due to an informant that informed state Hawaii law enforcement of Mr. Janus and his previous incarceration, they were able to open up a case and charge Mr. Janus with a wide variety of state crimes. And Mr. Janus decided this time not to go to trial. Smart move. He did plead guilty to 12 felony counts. And in fact, at his uh, sentencing, he shed a lot of tears for the judge. And his quote was, I want the Salvation Army, my victims, my family to know that I'm sorry. And I'm asking for their forgiveness. I also, Your Honor, even though I know I need to be punished, I'm asking you to have mercy on me. Now, the judge, however, had some words for Mr. Janice. Whatever else you are, you are a con man. You've shown that with what you've done in the past, and you've shown that what you've done here. Hopefully you have ripped off your last senior citizen. And in fact, thanks to the judge, Mr. Janus will be incarcerated in the state of Hawaii for 30 years and will be a senior citizen if and when he ever gets out. That is it for my presentation. Anybody have any questions?